The editor at Fast Company calls this week's guest a rare kind of leader and a truly engaging speaker. The former CEO of Southwest Airlines says he was enthralled by Andrew's speeches. Andrew Singer is now a VP at Constellation Energy. It's part of a Fortune 100 company, and he's lighting up, no pun intended on the energy, the business circuit. Yaakov, you were here when we sat down with Andrew. What did you think? I thought I want to go open a company and become a salesman after. Not kidding. I mean, I don't know if I really will go do that, but he had such good energy, very insightful, and very easy to listen to. How, to, how about you? How yeah. I, if we have to number how many lessons were in this episode, I would say it's probably between 40 and 80 different tips, lessons. He focused on two things. One is sales. And even if you're not in a sales department, how you sell yourself, um, the nuances with words that you use. Um, he's been around the world a bunch, very insightful. And then he also, his bread and butter is interviews. How do you interview someone? What, do you, what are the questions that you ask to find out who they are and what they're all about? And when you're being interviewed, what should you keep in mind? What not to say? He pulled Yaakov in um, off the cuff. Oh my gosh, yeah. I vaguely, yeah. Maybe skip that part. But you wrote down, you're like writing down lessons about I, interviewing people. Are you going to practice that? Yes. Right now, with Andrew, <laughs> in this episode, enjoy. Being a Jew, awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. We're privileged to have Andrew with us in studio. So much to talk about. I see this as a potential sales episode. I've listened to quite a few of your speeches, your YouTube videos. Um, but before we get into sales, let's talk about you. You are currently not an entrepreneur, but you were at one point in your life. Walk us through that. Uh, that's correct. So I was, a, uh, I was an entrepreneur who was in, in need of a job, so, or I was in need of a job and became an entrepreneur. So back when, a million years ago, I guess out of college, I was a buyer for Lord & Taylor, for those people that actually went shopping back in their youth in New York City. No longer around Lord & Taylor. Uh, that is correct. Right. That is correct. It was bought by May Company at the time, so I got to be an executive training program, and then I was just a regular New York buyer for a little while. And then I listened to my mother and went to law school in California. And then I practiced for a little while, and I realized that in the early 90s, I'm a little older than I look, I thank you for saying so, I appreciate it. Um, but in the early 90s, the law gig in California, where I was living at the time, uh, that's where my wife is from, was not doing too well. And I started looking for something to do. And through a bunch of different things, I was in the real estate business for a little while, doing some other things, practice law, obviously, for a little while. And um, I heard about looking at one of my ventures, something called, uh, in New York, they were sound, uh, sound preventing windows. They were basically a retrofit on the window. They were a frame that you put around the piece of Lucite. It's more exciting than it sounds. And you put it over your window and suddenly in New York, it would make your place warmer. And in California, it would make your place quieter. And I thought, wow, nobody's doing that here. I'm gonna do that. Didn't realize I was being an entrepreneur at the time. Went to a couple of home shows, started working with contractors, and after about six months, I broke even and realized I had no interest in ever selling anything to a residential customer or dealing with a contractor ever again. So through that, through that, and uh, through Yad Hashem, I uh, found myself eventually getting to the energy business. But I was an entrepreneur for six months. Why didn't it work out? Was it, were you poor at sales at the time? Was the product weak? What, what didn't go well? So without my ego jumping in, I was really good at the sales part. It was the dealing with the fact that if you listen to a lot of people that are entrepreneurs, they tell you you need to know absolutely everything about your business. That if no one showed up for work one day and you're the only one there, you have to be able to do everything. And I didn't know how to install my product. Mm. I didn't know how to cut my product. I didn't own a saw. So I needed to have a contractor or somebody working with me all the time doing a fabrication, working on a job, et cetera. I had jobs, I had people that were interested, but not having a company that I put together, taking that risky jump that true entrepreneurs do, I just wasn't willing to or ready to do it, but it gave me enough of a taste of it that I got the second best piece of advice in the world, which was just say no. And when something's not working out sometimes, sometimes the answer is no. And that's a very valuable lesson. And it's actually one of the best lessons in sales. 
which is, um, uh, since you were asking, one of Go the ahead. best things a salesperson can do is get their prospect to say no. If you actually try to get somebody to say no, you have a very good chance of actually making a sale because you're almost talking somebody out of it. And it's not a gimmick. It's not a trick. It's not anything. It's you're recognizing they're really not into it. So you're just like, this is not, this is really not what you're working on. No, no, stay a second. And you suddenly start to see people want to do it. Uh, back in the 70s, David Sandler, who's one of the premier sales coach systems, uh, which is something I actually enjoyed back in the day. Not an ad. I don't get anything for it. Um, but they used to call it um, the pushback back in the days of when sales techniques had, uh, had names. So you can imagine what it is. You're sitting and talking to somebody and you say, well, Mr. Ms. Customer, I have this, I have that. It's wonderful. And they're like, I'm just, I'm just really not sure. And you look at them and you re- suddenly realize it's not going to happen. And you do the pushback. You're like, I, I have five other appointments. I so appreciate you having invited me, but I have to pay my mortgage this month. I have kids' tuitions. Mm. You're lovely. I appreciate the coffee. I have to go. Is that reverse psychology? It's actually almost desperation. Uh-huh. And, and as the older person that taught me how to sell in my first real corporate sales job, it works every single time. And I don't mean to say it works from a schmoozy technique type thing. You're literally looking at the person and saying, you're not going to buy from me today. It's just not going to happen. You're selling me everything that says you don't want it. I have to go. I'm not going to keep trying to sell you something that I know you don't want and you seem to not need. And when you do the pushback, they usually ask you to stay. They do. Hmm. So they go completely 180. What happens about 30 seconds ago? They said, I don't want your product for whatever reason. You do the pushback. They look you in the eye and they say, you know, I might actually use your product. I want you. What? what? Sounds what like I, a big, uh, what big I jump. Call, yeah. What I call it with my salespeople, it's kind of like a breakthrough at that moment. You've kind of broken the glass that exists oftentimes between a salesperson and a prospect, which is uh, prospects, especially Americans, Mm. are adverse to saying no. They'll say, I'll get back to you in two weeks. It's so nice of you to talk to me. I just, I can't do this right now. Can I speak to my spouse? Just let, can I, I'll just be right back. And it's that type of thing. But when you suddenly respond, there are other, I I don't know how much you want to get into sales at the moment, but it's called challenging and other things. Oh, I want to get into it. yeah, Yeah, at that moment, you're breaking down a barrier uh-huh. because you've broken what I'll call a social mold or a, or a or a, a constant polite mode, which is you're actually looking at another American, if you will, and saying, "No, I gotta go. This is not happening." And people, it's it creates a tension, mm-hmm. and it's usually a good tension, which allows something to change. And oftentimes, everything comes down and like, "Well, tell me again, what was like? Remind me." Interesting. And in your head, you're like, "I just told you what it was," <laughs> but you start over again. Right. But you don't talk too much. You listen, uh-huh. and you and you begin the process all over again. So you mentioned listening. How much of sales is listening versus promoting? Exactly 18 minutes is speaking, and exactly <laughs> 42 minutes is listening. Of every hour, a salesperson should never speak for more than about 18 minutes. If 18 they do, minutes. if they do, they're probably not going to get the sale. Is a bulk of that 18 minutes in the first half of the meeting? No. If you're doing sales in the way that I think is correct, and this is another thing that I enjoy, which is called question-based selling, um, it's, it's, it's not just throwing questions. It's beginning a process where you're in an inquiry mode, but you're not in an inquiry mode where you're acting. You need to understand the prospect's business. You need to know things about their business. You need to understand how your product relates to their business, and you begin that process with a question or something. If you begin the process with the, hey, can I show you the slide about how amazing I am? Mm -hmm. Then you're already in the same place as everybody else. Look, I have 12 customers nearby. Look, this is who I am. Look, I went to college. Look, I have da, 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 da. And everybody's like, you know, they're asleep. They're gone. They're Mm -hmm. done. But the first thing is, is, Ellie, I noticed you're building fairly busy street. Does the noise bother your clients when they're here? That's funny. You should say that actually it does. Well, I noticed that the glass is like from 1957, according to the date on the bottom. You know that you're probably good for a rebate with the utility company right now to actually update your glass. No, I had no idea. Tell me more. And we're suddenly in a conversation. It's amazing. But it's not schmooze. It's not fake. It's not acting. I just just don't want anybody who's listening to this think that sales is just like, oh, I need to just be... No. Um, your, Your brother actually said the word to me before, and it's part of sales. It's being authentic and sincere at all moments. 
if somebody sniffs anything wrong, and this is what I do in my interview coaching and other things, if somebody sniffs insincerity or being inauthentic or anything, you've killed everything at that moment. It doesn't matter if it feels good at that moment. People are just being polite. You're dead in the water and you're done. Very interesting. We, um, in my company at Harvesting Media, we went to conferences and we had to pay because we were presenting to perspectives and the prospective clients get to go to the conference for free. Mm. And while I'm meeting with these 10 different companies and they're there, they have to meet with you for 15 minutes. I'm like, this is a home run. They're smiling at me. They're there. I'm going to have 10 sales here. And then after the conference, not one of those prospective clients got back to me. Right. Um, so it that, just takes one of those conferences to never go to one again. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly the way we're thinking. Um, okay, so a few things off of that. You mentioned it was your second best piece of advice. What is your best piece of advice that you've uh, received? My best piece of advice that I received is probably the thing that I mentioned, which was the listening piece. Oh, the listening. Okay. Yeah, the listening piece. Um, being able to hold your tongue, and I, which I didn't demonstrate in the first five minutes we've had here, but being able to hold your tongue and let the person close themselves. And that's not just in a sales situation, it's in all situations. If you can put your ego aside, if you could recognize that you gain more by listening, then you are already in a position of, I hate to use the word power, but you're in the driver's seat in a lot of situations because most people like to speak but never get the ability to or the time to, and most people aren't listened to. If you're able to listen to somebody, you become their friend. You become somebody they begin to trust in an odd business sense. And a lot of things happening happen if you can just keep quiet. Mm. If you're just blessed with just that second before you respond to actually think, you can do a lot more in that moment as opposed to just, I know what I have to say is way more important than what they're saying. Or wait, I got something to tell you. Hold on, save it for another time. Mm. The medium we're talking about where someone's with someone for 60 minutes, that's in person, right? Especially post-COVID here. Yeah. Do the same, does the same apply on a Zoom meeting? Are we doing 1842? And then when it comes to selling in an email, and we'll get into the specifics yeah. there, how does, the, how, how does that change? So in, in the world of Zoom and Teams and everything else that you're doing, you're basically on TV. I've been on TV for about 22 months now. Um, I haven't been back in the office. Um, it'll be March, it'll be two years. Um, I run a sales team of almost 50 people in the US um, who have all been on TV for the last two years. So the answer to your question is it gets modified. There are a lot of things that have to happen first and it has to start in the beginning. So the first question is, are you in your sweatpants? <laughs> are you dressed for work? What's your background? Literally, your background. Have you blurred it? Is it professional? Is it diapers? What's going on behind you? Mm -hmm. And then what are you doing in the screen? Are you looking at the camera or are you looking at the person on the screen? Are you moving your eyes around? What are you doing to make it happen? All of these things seem really weird. And then there's a, oh, are you using your phone? Hey, I just want to check with you. Can you only see my eyeball or can you actually see all of me? Mm. Do you know how many times people don't ask and they find out the entire meeting, people are just staring at their eyebrow the entire time or like right into their mouth mm -hmm. and they have no idea. Mm. And it's the little things like that that actually make the adjustment to being on screen better. Now, with regard to the speaking, what I found works best is usually you try to establish some sort of connection over the screen. You look to where somebody's eyes are you look to see if they're doing the back and forth with their eyes, which means they're also reading emails while they're talking to you. Mm -hmm. That's a bad thing. That mm -hmm. means you've lost their attention very early or they're working with two screens and you're competing. You try to see what's, what's actually going on. Mm. Once you've done that, the suggestion that I make to my people is try to do a combo presentation where you have some sort of mixed media going on. So usually with Teams, you have the ability to do this. I, th I think Zoom can do this as well. You can actually set up multiple screens while you're speaking or you can have a presentation and your face, not just your voice, your face going back and forth and referring to something. And the change that we've also made is we try to basically have very few words on it and a picture of some sort so that there's no reason for somebody to stare at it and read while you're speaking. Then the question is, is how long? And I found that the same way that people basically have their attention span is very short, the hour meeting it tends to be too long when you're doing on screen. I try to ask people to keep it under 30 minutes and to do many, many check-ins with people. Like, do you agree with that? Or 
How would you handle this? The questioning style in that and keeping the conversation going and moving away from presentation, which people fall into on screen, is unbelievably important as well. Is that helpful? That yes, looking- very helpful. Okay. Um, you said emails also. Email, yes. Yeah. So yeah. if you're emailing, cold emailing someone, or even if they are, they're expecting your email, let's talk subject lines. Yeah. What's a good subject line and what's a poor subject line? So I'll give you the best subject line, and this came from actually, I hope you don't mind if I mention things that I've enjoyed. So there, there are a few sales trainings that I've actually found helpful. There are a couple of books that I found helpful. So I've, I, I was um, lucky enough, we, we, um, we used something called question-based selling for a while, a guy named Tom Fries. He's on LinkedIn and you can see him. Um, he's very talented. I enjoy what he does. I think he does a great job. His, his suggestion, um, and I have my people use this, is something of the following. Something that usually said, just got off the trader's update, very interesting mention of your market, call me. Or just ended with traders, something very important about your account, please take a look. Or something like that. It's something that basically is very immediate, very real. It has to be real and take somebody's attention because it hits them financially. So in my business, people buy electricity. The price of electricity changes all the time. People are on short contracts, long time contracts, real-time contracts. And I do get briefed by our head of economics, by our traders, by people that manage portfolios, et cetera. So very likely in one of those weekly things, someone who may be buying power in New York, they have a contract coming up. I just got briefed by the New York trader. And he just said, looks like prices are gonna be up over the next 12 months. I'm like, I need, to, I need to call you know, Fred and Wilma. Mm-hmm. They own a building in New York. Fred and Wilma spoke to New York Trader. Interesting, interesting information on your accounts. Let's follow up. Or see below, I'll call you. What do you think the open rate is on an email like that? So if it's an existing customer and you're trying to do a renewal, the open rate is really high. If it's completely a prospect in cold, that's going to be the same stuff you get from anybody because they don't know who you are. Mm. So then it's going to be you're basically blasting it out for a thousand. And you're hoping for the one or two percent return, but it has to be real. Um, on on blast emails and cold emails, I'm not as big of a uh, fan. Um, so how do you get in touch with? So someone? we do a lot of different things, and there's a lot of different things that a lot of companies do. Um, you had asked me before about LinkedIn. There's LinkedIn targeting. There's the advanced LinkedIn stuff, which is interesting in inviting people. That has some return for some people. I got so many of those. It has to be highly targeted, authentic, and it cannot smell like it's just marketing. It has to be a white paper. It has to be a five-minute uh, introduction by your head of economics. It has to be something that is actually relevant and is actually authentic. If it's just the blast, your taxes are going up, call me tomorrow, then then there's a problem. So I get I, I can only see the first two sentences or a subject line in one sentence from all these cold LinkedIners. I don't open most of them. So what do they need to put, assuming they don't know who I am and I don't know who they are, what do they need to put in that subject line or first sentence that's going to create an interest in me to open it? So I'm not an expert on the LinkedIn stuff. We have people that work on it for us. We don't get a ton of leads, but what I've seen us do that's successful in other people in my industry is something that literally says, New York State Public Utility Commission about to change rule 1205 can affect most commercial buildings, Mm. dot, dot, dot. Uh, Con Edison has recently increased their paybacks for lighting, the rates are, dot, dot, dot. Mm. Something that literally speaks to somebody's wallet is authentic, is real, and doesn't have just yuck after it where it's like, oh my gosh, why did I open this? Those types of things are important where they actually point to something that people would not normally see and demonstrates your expertise in the area that you're asking them to look into. That's had decent return rates, but not perfect. Okay. And I would assume it applied to cold emails as well, LinkedIn. Yeah. So I'm not, what like I said, cold emails are still targeted. Mm -hmm. So you need a reason, somebody needs to know why they're getting it. Also, stuff getting stuck in spam filters these days and everything else, the cold email stuff is very difficult. Mm -hmm. My preference for all the people that work for me is trying to figure out a way to get in on a phone call. Phone call, okay, that's where I was wanting to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm still old school on phone calls, and the best thing you can possibly do are obviously referrals. But cold, cold, like no referral, right. no anything else, is you know exactly who you're calling and you just keep pounding. 
You try the 7.30 in the morning, you try the 5.30 in the afternoon. You become friends with the person, that's the admin. You try to work your way up. You try to do what we call dating different people in a given company. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got in at the secretary level, couldn't get up to the CFO, so I started with the bookkeeper. I went from the bookkeeper, I asked for a copy of a bill. I looked up something else. So we have a lot of things that you start filling in the blanks, mm -hmm. so that if you do get lucky or you get pushed to something, you could get in there. Back in the day, a cold call literally would have been a knock on the door and you could have said, hey, I just finished serving one of your neighbors over here. They had said you might be interested. Quasi-referral, quasi-next to somebody, it's there. But cold, cold, it's it's legwork, it's hang-ups, it's smiling and dialing, it's it's tough. I was watching one of your videos where you were presenting in Baltimore, I think at a TribeWorks event, and you asked the audience, when is the best time to call a business if you're looking to sell them something? Right. What are the various answers you get and what is the right answer? Right, so the answers, I, there's always somebody that's read a sales book and has a decent feeling for okay. it. So the right answer is early in the morning. And the early in the morning is because a business owner is usually the person that's there and there's no gatekeeper in place. So most businesses will open eight or 8.30, usually 8.30, I'll say maybe nine, not in California though, because they're off already. Um, but usually 8.30 or nine. So at that point you have, a, you have a gatekeeper that's picking up. But if you can get a direct number or you guess at a direct number, if you will, as opposed to one that ends in a double zero, you have a chance of getting somebody that's responsible picking up. And that moment, that first five seconds, you gotta know who the person is, and you have to get in there and say, I was referred to you by, I noticed that you, I was this, or are you able to, or thank you. You have to have something that is relevant to them in those first five seconds. I was reviewing bills in your area. I was reviewing your business. Did you know that? Thank you so much for picking up. Yeah, it, it's something around that, that place. Is that helpful? Yeah, so in, you're doing that thing where on the Zoom you say, you have to ask if it's helpful. So, it's a check-in. Check-in. You want to make sure I'm not uh, off in another, another... No, I want to actually find out if what I'm saying to you is relevant and helpful. Uh -huh. And if it's not relevant and helpful, usually your facial expression will tell me that, uh -huh. and we'll probably change topics at that point. Gotcha. So after five seconds, if you don't hook them, they're, they're, they're I done, hate right? the term hook. Not necessarily. If they don't hang up, then they're not done. Uh -huh. So the hang up is done. Uh -huh. The I got to get off the phone is done but maybe a question or maybe an answer. So what they do in question-based selling, which I love, uh -huh. is it's, Mr. Customer, can I ask you a couple of specifics about dot, dot, dot? And this is in question-based selling with Tom Fries. And the reason I love it is it's a question. If you take apart the question, what somebody registers is couple, which means two, and specific means specific. So you're already getting somebody on a subconscious level that you may be real for a second and they want to do something. And people can modify it and think about it differently. But it's that whole idea of, Ellie, thanks so much for picking up. I was wondering if I could ask you something specific about what you did last week on on, on David Bishevkin's interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, listen to the interview. What? Mm -hmm. Well, he mentioned a certain book that he was doing. I didn't get the title of the book, but he said it was about this. Could you give me an idea of what you were thinking on that? Why, why are you calling? Well, actually, we met, blah, 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 blah. And then we're potentially in a conversation. So it always of, sounds good when I do the role play. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Reality is one percent return. You're developing some sort of relationship and rapport with someone incrementally, almost. Yes. Yes. Very interesting. Is text message? If you were to get someone's phone number, maybe not from a referral or a contact you found it online, is text message too? Intrusive? It's interesting you say that. So generationally speaking, I manage people that probably range in age from people that I would say are, you know, in their 60s to people that are in their 20s. The people in their 20s and 30s love doing texting. Mm -hmm. And they actually love LinkedIn. Not for advertising, but for working connections and working through. So one of the people that works for me, she is brilliant in her process. She begins by looking up the company, finding out things about it, finding out names of people in the company, and then looking for them on LinkedIn. She then begins the process of seeing, hey, does anybody that's in my network know that person? Looks, finds out stuff, maybe gets an introduction, which helps tremendously. Those are the things that LinkedIn really helps with, because mm -hmm. you never know if somebody knows somebody or they just you know press yes on a connect and they don't know somebody. They then will work a process to see, can they get the person's phone number? Can they figure out what their text number is? If they can, then what I've seen her do and what I've had other people copy is, Mr., Ms., so-and-so, my name is blank, blank, I'm with so-and-so, sorry for the text, but. Sorry to contact you this way, but. Didn't want to take up your time, but. This is who I am, this is what I do, this is why I think it's relevant to you, straight up. 
she gets callbacks. She gets a text back. That's awesome. But she's replaced the other things we were talking about. She's replaced some of the old school Zig Ziglar, you know, like, hey, how do I get you in a car today? She's replaced a lot of that with using technology, but not using technology in an old way. So to me, the big ads on LinkedIn, that's kind of using something cool in an old way, using it for the research and figuring out a way to connect with somebody in some way, some way that feels authentic and real. It still has some, uh, it still has some, uh, it still has staying power, if you will. How do you know who the decision makers are? You can think you're reaching the right person because it says VP in his title, but really it's the person two levels above him, two levels below him, that is the core decision maker. Right. Is there any way to know? In corporate America, you can usually find a, uh, an org chart on most of their websites. So that's a good way to get an idea of where somebody's actually placed. That's number one. Titles don't necessarily help, but as I said, it's always good to date a lot of people. So one of the ways to actually deal with a company and find out more is if you actually get through to somebody, ask them as you're developing the relationship, hey, what's your role in all this process? When you guys buy XYZ, what's your role in that? Well, actually, this is what I do. You end up signing the contract or somebody else? Well, actually, it's funny you mention it. You know, Joan actually signs the contract. Oh, I've never met Joan before. Who's Joan? Well, you know, Joan Smith, they work over at corporate in Delaware. Oh, mm -hmm. would you possibly feel comfortable like introducing me or something? People don't mind asking questions if you're asking them in a real way. And sometimes finding out who the decision maker is is as easy as asking the person that you're actually talking to. Otherwise, an org chart. Otherwise, asking other people that may know a company. It's doing research. There's a lot that can be done these days, a lot you can glean on the internet, and you ask other people questions and figure out what they know. Let's assume someone doesn't have the personality for sales. A lot of it, I, I, w I would imagine, could be learned, but they're terrible, right? They're listening to this. They said, I've tried so much of this. I've read the right. book you referenced. I'm not good at this. Is there no hope? And, and the solution is they have to hire someone to do it for them, or this is something that they can legitimately get better at? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack in what you just asked. So the hire somebody, hold on that, because I want to talk about that okay. for a second. Um, the first question I would ask is, how did somebody get into sales in the first place? Like, what are they doing in that sales position and what made them do it in the first place? And that gets to the whole idea of, are they on a salary or are they on commission? Are they working for somebody or is it their company? Uh, do they, are they tr pretending to be somebody's you know, son-in-law or daughter-in-law or, or are they actually related? Like, what, mm. what's going on and why is that person in a sales situation at that moment? Th that's what I want to know in specifically helping somebody. But to, to address your question, the proof is in the pudding. I if you're not making sales, then you're not selling well. Whether or not you're not meant to be a salesperson, I can't answer that question without having an understanding. I can guarantee you if the person that hired you says this product sells itself, all you have to be is really nice and schmoozy and you'll be just fine, it's, uh, it's not for you. Hmm. And if they hired you in 100% commission and said, oh, product sells itself, I would run away hmm. in a lot of cases because that's just not the way it is. And where you said, should I hire somebody, what it made me think of is a business owner exactly. who is successful because if they didn't sell their product, they didn't eat dinner that night. So they figured out how to sell their product. They might have made concessions initially. They might have changed things, done deals, et cetera. But they're an entrepreneurial owner, and they happen to be good enough to have sold their product. That's why they actually have a business. They're now going to look at everybody else they hire and say, why aren't you as good as me? And it's a very difficult position to be in. So to the owner, you need to either have somebody else hire a salesperson for you that knows what they're looking for and they can go through a process, or you need to actually back down just a bit and look at what it is you're actually hiring. You're not hiring yourself. You're not hiring another owner. You're hiring somebody that's trainable, coachable, and you feel has the ability to sell. I have friends in the insurance business that actually pay for the personality test that you can do online and they get back the results and they give you an idea of where people's strengths and weaknesses are. And some of those things are telling as to whether they're introverts or extroverts. I actually test in the middle. I actually have one point over on the introvert side mm. from that perspective. My wife likes my shyness. <laughs> but, but extroverts sell better? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But people think they do. Right. It's kind of like the, the, the mother saying to the child, oh, you talk so much, you should be a lawyer. Right? I don't know if they're going to be a lawyer or not. Actually, people have the brains of engineers actually make better lawyers, in my estimation, having gone to law school. The people with the big mouths 
they got in, but they didn't get in because of their big mouth. They get in because of their LSATs and their grades. So the big mouth idea doesn't mean anything. So if you somebody see somebody with personality and a great suit and everything, you think they're gonna be a great salesperson, well, you just got sold because you just bought the whole picture that you saw, but you have no idea if they can sell something. So it takes a lot of conversation and understanding what somebody's process is. With that said, a salesperson to get a job needs to be able to sell the product at that moment, which is themselves. And when you're interviewing somebody, if you're bored within a couple of seconds of speaking to them, the prospect's going to be bored. Mm -hmm. If you're not believing anything they're saying, the prospect's not going to believe them. If you're not wanting to speak to the person, if you don't think you could be friends with this person, if you don't believe all of these things, they're not the person you should hire. Mm -hmm. But if they're engaging and they've made you want to speak to them for a half hour, there's a chance that they may be able to somebody that could then learn your product. So I'm a business owner. I've interviewed people. I've hired people. I've not hired people. And there are sometimes you can hire someone thinking that they're a good fit based on the 30 minute conversation, based on a recommendation letter. And then when they get to the workplace, they're not necessarily a team player, which is very difficult to examine and assess in an interview. So how do you interview for things that someone could be either putting on a good show in, in, in the space, but they're terrible to be a coworker with. Um, I guess the question is about the intangibles mm -hmm. versus, hey, here's my resume, here's what I did in sales. You know, I, I, I don't care what you've, do, you've done in the past. I care what you're going to do in the future, but more importantly, how are you going to work together with my team? Right. Ellie, you brought up a lot of interesting things just in that, in that brief description. So are you talking about hiring a salesperson? Let's, let's assume in this case we're talking about hiring a salesperson, okay. but really for anyone out there that's looking to hire, the question still stands. So if it was a salesperson, the key thing that you said to me was you find out the person's not a team player. Why does a salesperson need to be a team player? They're working, I, I, I understand the premise, but they're working together with my graphic designer who's creating the pitch decks. They're working together with one of the account managers to figure out what a prospective client needs. They are going to have some sort of collaboration with other teams. If this person you hired, Ellie, 30 days into the job, they hate them in the office. Everybody hates when the person walks in. Horrible. They're complaining nonstop. On day 31, they bring in the biggest deal you've ever seen. How upset are you about the rest of the people being annoyed at them? Uh, um, probably uh, throwing a few grains of salt to what I just said. The reason I say it is the following. There are usually, I can't remember all four, but you never want to bring up a number if you can't remember all of them. Okay. But there's an interesting book by the Corporate Executive Board called The Challenger Sale. Okay, we can put and, it in the show notes. So. Yes, yeah, so in that, they describe the type of salespeople that exist, and one of them is called the lone wolf as a description. All of the people that they talk about have success to some extent. The lone wolf is somebody that basically you never see him in the office. When you do, they don't necessarily get along with people. They're out there on the road all the time, and just when you think they're wasting your money, they're bringing a big deal. Hmm. And then there's the challenger. And the challenger person is the person, if you're sitting in a meeting with them with one of your clients, you're like, oh my gosh, how could they? They're, they're, not, they're not being polite. And you suddenly realize, well, they are being polite. They're just asking tough questions. Oh my gosh, the customer's responding. They're answering the questions. They're challenging them. They're, they're, they're not afraid to ask them the tough questions. But we're getting off the topic here. So the answer to your question is, is you have to ask yourself, what am I hiring this person to do? Now, should anybody be mean to people in the office? Of course not. Hmm. Not being a team player may be what makes the person an excellent salesperson. But the answer to your question on the other end is the following. If you're hiring somebody that's going to be working with your graphic designer, your scheduler, your blah, 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 all of these things, then have those people interview them as well. Mm. Pay somebody to come in for a day to hang out in your office. Be respectful. Don't ask them to take their own time if necessary. Or buy them lunch. Have them hang out for a day. Will they be on their best behavior? Of course they are. But after the day, the five people you speak to, someone's going to be honest with you. And someone's going to say, they were awesome. Someone's going to say, eh, I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? What, what happened? Well, they this, they that. I was at Radio City Music Hall a million years ago with somebody, and we got tickets to listen to Jack Welch. Uh, be interview, interviewed by, I think, Maria Bartiromo. And um, it was just when he stopped being CEO and he was pushing his own thing and everything. And the question was just straight up, what was the biggest challenge you ever had in your professional career? He did not even blink an eye and he said, hiring. 
and everybody's like on the edge of their seat because they thought he was going to say, well, you know, the Dow Jones is hiring. He's like, I only got it right 50% of the time if I was lucky. Mm. And then he went on to talk about it's like, I would interview somebody, we'd bring people in. I mean, and he's like, I only got involved with people at the highest levels. He's like, 50% of the time, maybe I would get it right. And he said, you know what was the worst? The great interviews that were lousy workers. (laughs) He's like, some people give great interviews and they're just horrible when you hire them. And he said, some people give horrible interviews and you don't hire them and you read about them a year later and you're like, oh my gosh, I let that one get away. Mm. So don't feel so bad, Ellie. Hiring is one of the hardest things to do. What I've seen, if you want to know, is a best practice yes, for hiring. very much so. Okay. Group interviews. Group interviews. You don't mean like 15 people. No, no. Usually right. like two or three people on one is helpful. Okay. One or two single people interviews. The big boss interview to see what they do. So groups. And also in the group interviews, part of that interview being fixed questions that everyone asks the same thing and actually grades the person on. So when you do a review, you're not just getting only subjective, well, it was kind of this, kind of that. You force somebody to write down a number one to five, and that's a great basis for a discussion. Also, as you get- Who's writing the number one to five? If you're interviewing me, there are three of you here, they say, Andrew, it's so nice to meet you. Please give me an idea when you had a challenge with somebody at the office, how you dealt with it. I'm like, oh, uh, this is, and I finish, and you roll discreetly write down one to five. You write down one, person next to you writes down a five, five being the best, of course. The other person writes down a five. Then later on, when you're doing the, uh, the download, you have everybody in a call or in the office. Hey, let's go on question number one. Dealt with somebody difficult in the office. What do you think? Well, I thought it was a one. Why? I thought it was a five. Why? You're the boss. You now have to think about how that was. Then when you're done with some of the, I'll call it objective stuff, just the heck of it, what were your impressions? Why do you think that? Do you think you could work with this person every day? Could you look at this person in the office every day? Is this somebody that you would ask to go to lunch, get into personal things, et cetera? What you're really getting at is whether this person could be friends with people. That gives you an idea whether somebody's going to be a team player or not in, in, in my in my experiences, that's usually something that helps. Even if they're a lone wolf? So if you're hiring somebody for sales, even if they've done poorly on that, mm-hmm. now you asking questions or looking at their past uh, performance to decide, are they gonna be excellent in sales? And that's a different thing there. Mm-hmm. What has been your past? If you're hiring somebody where you say, I need five years experience. Where did you work five years ago? I worked for McDonald's as a uh, corporate salesperson selling whatever, not, not, IBM, I was selling this, or Apple, I was selling this. What were your results? How did you do? I was always over plan. I was this. Next job, I worked for this bank. I did mortgages. What were your results? How did you do? And you ask so that you feel as if they're justified and that they're telling you the truth. And you say, okay, this person's a great salesperson. That's great. Then you might ask, um, how many people did you need to work with on a sale? What do you mean? Did you have an account manager? Did you have a graphic person that was helping you with presentations? How did you get your leads? What did you do? And you just give people enough rope to see if they keep talking. Salespeople like to talk even though they're not supposed to, especially in interviews. And they may say something sometimes that's either a gem in a good way or a gem in a bad way. Mm-hmm. But the more you let somebody go, the more likely they are to let something out that's going to give you an idea of a yes or a no. Is it risky to hire someone that has no sales experience but you think has the potential to be a good salesperson? Right? A lot of people listening, they may have startups. They can't afford someone on a full-time salary, benefits, et cetera, that some salespeople that are seasoned veterans are getting. How do they bolster up or in, or scale up their sales team without Right. You've losing. asked a great question that has a lot in it. So the thing I'll give you first is an example. So as I understand that the legends of Zappos is, they go through a very big hiring process, they hire you, and then after your first day, they ask you if you want to stay there. I say, what do you mean? I'll give you $2,000 now to leave, or you can have your job. And if you take the money then you weren't meant to be there. Mm. And if you stay, it's probably because you like what you have going on. Why do they give them the two grand? Because they're not gonna find out for six months to a year whether the person's right. How much time have they invested? In forget the salary, for, forget that. How much time and effort? When you're paying a new employee, first thing is you're paying them. Second thing is, is your salary is going to training the person. Mm-hmm. The third thing is, is all the time and effort. And if they turn out to be a toxic employee, how many other people have you heard in your office? Or lost. Exactly. So the question becomes, when you just said, oh, suppose they can't afford to hire somebody that's going to be and they want to take it, why would anybody 
who is necessarily on the edge of not knowing if their business is going to be successful, take a flyer on somebody to be their salesperson when that person basically is going to have to duplicate what they were doing so they can now take the next step. If you're going to invest in something and your business is based on the next customer, seems to me you want to invest as much as you can in that first salesperson. Now, are you going to hire the best salesperson in the world because they're just available to go to some small company? No. Mm -hmm. So you need to do a lot of research to figure out how you're going to find somebody that's somewhere in the middle that can be trained but has that seasoning, if you will. And in some cases, it may be somebody that's older that may be second career. Like, I was in sales for 30 years and now I'm looking for what's next, Mm -hmm. but I'm willing to be in sales. I'm willing to take a bit more of a risk than I did before. They may be a little old school, but they actually know what they're talking about. And they know people and they know what they're doing. When we spoke about it from the interviewee or interviewer point of view, when someone gets an interview at their dream job, they, they get their suit cleaned, they're putting on their best shirt, they buy a new tie, they call you up, they say, Andrew, could be a nephew or niece of, you, of yours, what do I have to keep in mind? What are the top five things... I should do, should not do. I want this job. I don't want to mess this up. Teach me. Right. So, so one of my greatest passions uh, in Baltimore is working with young people on interview skills. Um, Rabbi Berger and my buddy Stewie Shabbos asked me probably about 17 years ago, uh, Andrew, you're in sales, right? Yes. Do you interview a lot of people? Yes. We have so-and-so. He has an interview coming up tomorrow. Could you help him? Sure. And that was the beginning of probably... A lot, a lot of people doing mm-hmm. it. And, and, it's, and it's turned into job interviews for men and women. It's turned into grad school interviews, med school, um, and other things. And it's, it's, it's extremely rewarding. The only thing I'll say to that generation is, let people know whether you get the job or get into school. It's the only thing I never find out about it until mm-hmm. later on. Anyway, with that said, so I have, a, I have a basis on what it is that I do. I have a almost, it's not canned, but I have a process that I go through with somebody. So the first question I ask somebody, and if you'll indulge me, We'll do Please. this so you can be coming in. So, Ellie, what's the purpose of an interview? I know the answer mm-hmm. because I did watch many of your videos prior, but do you want me to give you the real answer? No, you can give me the answer. It's fine. The goal of an interview is to get someone to like you in a very short amount of time. So, hold on one second. <laughs> He's smiling at That's the camera. Not his. That's not us. <laughs> Thank you. You listened. Yes. Yeah. The goal of an interview is to get somebody to like you. So what most people will say is, well, I want to be able to let them know what's on my resume. I want to tell them while I'm good for the job. I want to, I want to, I want to. I say, those are all wonderful things. I said, but nobody hires somebody that they don't like unless the only thing they need is a genius in the box. What's a genius in the box? You're the smartest person in the world in this thing. And whether you have a personality or not, whether you're nice or not, it doesn't matter. They basically need your brain in the office. And that's okay. It's not a bad thing. You've been, you've been blessed with an amazing brain and you're a nice person, but they're not hiring you for sales. They're not hiring you to be on a team. They're hiring you because you're brilliant and you're going to be a genius in a box and that's okay. But for most situations, for any other job and not just sales, finance, anything where you're on a team, people are not going to hire somebody they don't like. And, and that's, that's the main thing. So I said, when you go in an interview, you're basically standing on a plateau. And your goal is to walk out of the room with the person interviewing you, figured uh, illustratively, of course, not for real, because mostly everybody's from that's coming in. You want them to have their arm around your shoulder and saying, you see this person next to me? I want you to hire them. Mm -hmm. I'm putting my name down, hire, I want you to hire this person right here. That is the goal of an interview, to get there. And it's just literally just a little. It's just a little. It's not a lot. It's a little. With every answer you give, You're standing on that plateau and there's a mountain in front of you and there's a huge hole on the other side, cliff. With each answer you give, you're either falling into that cliff and down that hill and falling into the abyss or you're starting up the mountain. Your goal is to either be in the same place you started or slightly higher. You want that arm around your shoulder. That's the goal of an interview. So I'll ask you the first question, but you have it already. Did Yaakov watch the uh, video? He did not, no. Well, I don't know if he's really in the shot or not. I'm not, but you could ask if I can go in. So. So Yaakov, yeah. So Yaakov, you uh, you come in. I say, Yaakov, nice to meet you. Good to see you. Thank you for coming in. Can I get you a drink? Okay. First of all, I'm a little nervous that I'm being interviewed. I didn't even know I'm being okay, interviewed. You so. got this. You got this. Let's hey, go. Sorry. Yaakov, nice yes. to meet you. You've given me a nice firm handshake. If I'm a woman, you've asked your Shilas. I'm not even going to get into okay. that. Okay. And I, that's nothing against, but that's what I tell people: make sure that you ask Shilas prior to an interview. 
woman talking to you, all of the other things, I'm not a rov. Just make sure you speak to somebody. And if you want coaching on that, come back and I'll help you deal with whatever your answers are. Let's leave it at that. With that said, though, Yaakov, nice to meet you. Before we get started, can I get you something to drink? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. <clears throat> Yaakov, it's nice to meet you. Can I get you something to drink? Uh, yes, I like Mountain Dew. Okay. So that's interesting. So that's a bad answer, also. I'll oh, give gosh. you one more chance. <laughs> I'm like going to the other extreme. I can listen to this, Barbara. Can I try? Yeah, sure. Okay. Elliot, it is so nice to meet you. Thank you for coming in. Can I get you a drink? It is great to meet you as well. How are you? I, I would like a drink. You would like a drink. Okay. Um, here you go. Here's a random glass that has orange liquid in it. Okay, shoot. I would like a drink of water, please. Okay, that's a bad answer also. Terrible. Okay, Yaakov, can you get hired and refired? Okay, so we're going to go talk about this now. So you can go back. Yeah, okay, drink. All right. So, so here's the deal. So I deal mostly, obviously, with from people that I'm speaking to. So right. there are always kashras issues, right? There's also the whole idea of creating menches and menchets uh, when they're in there for coming in. Why do I go through this? And people get annoyed. They really, they really, they really ask you this question. I was like, what if they do? Like, remember I told you, you want the arm around your shoulder when you're walking out. Right. So you do it. Andrew, so nice to meet you. Can I get you a drink? Andrew, it's a pleasure to meet you. Can I get you a drink? Um, are you having anything? I am not. But I want to know if you want a drink. Uh, that's so nice of you. Um, you know, I'm good. I actually caffeined up before you came in. I'm good. Thank you so much for asking. I appreciate it. My pleasure. So let's get started. Great. So what just happened? What just happened? You asked me if I wanted a drink. Okay? Remember, you're in America, and you're an American, all right? And we talked about Americans not liking the word no. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everybody that's listening read Malcolm Gladwell's Blink. So they know that people make a decision about you in about a split second, what they're doing. So if you say the word no to an American, are you falling in the hole? You're going up the mountain. You want to know. If you're, in this case. In this case, if you say no to an offer of a drink, are you falling in the hole or are you going up the mountain? You're falling in the hole. That's correct. Is that where you want to be in the interview? No. Exactly. No. No, you <laughs> don't. So here's the deal. If you say yes, because you're a nice kosher person, you have the fear of what? Tray landing in front of you, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard with a drink, but let's just say it's a glass. You have no idea. It's, it's orange liquid. It could be tang from the 70s. You don't mm -hmm. know what it is. So that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And if that glass sits in front of you the entire interview, what do you think I'm thinking about the entire interviewer instead of how smart you are? Andrew has not taken a sip. Exactly. And it becomes annoying. Mm -hmm. And it becomes basically the legend of Ellie. Remember that guy that was in here? Nice guy. I, I really liked him. Nice shirt, everything. What was with the orange stuff? Mm -hmm. And you're suddenly realizing... You're not getting the job because all they want to know is why you didn't drink anything. Mm -hmm. So when you say, are you having something? It basically, A, humbles you. B, puts you in a menschlich position that you're asking something and you're like, I don't want you to make you to get up if you don't need to. Mm -hmm. And it also protects you, if you will. So the person says, yeah, I'm actually getting a coffee. Would you like something? Black coffee would be great. Thank you so much. I'm actually getting some water. Can I get you some? I'm getting a Coke. Um, do you have any water? Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you. Now, when Yaakov said, yes, get me a Mountain Dew. Now, he didn't say it that way, but that's what's being processed. Mm -hmm. What's being processed is the yes is fine. You've now just ordered somebody that you just met five seconds ago to do something for you. Whether you meant it poorly or not, somewhere deep down there's the potential of a negative registry. Mm -hmm. I know everybody's thinking like, oh, just stop already. Mm -hmm. But I'm a big believer in this. Mm -hmm. You have not done something that's putting the arm around the shoulder. You've potentially done something that's sending you tumbling. But there's so many questions that an interviewer can ask that has the potential to set up deep conscious negative connotations in your responses. They walk in, they're like, I hope he asks me for a drink. I know the answer. But there are dozens of questions in, in every interview. How do you stay safe but also put your guard down a little bit, just be yourself. So what was the goal of the interview? To, to get someone to like you in a right. short amount of So time. there are three things that I asked somebody to do. The first one is be covetic. In, in, in the parlance for this interview, for this uh, podcast, be respectful. It doesn't mean everybody listening is disrespectful. It means what does it mean to be respectful? So with a lot of guys that come to see me, they're yeshiva guys, so I say picture the Rosh Yeshiva. I obviously don't speak in the third person in an interview situation that might seem odd to somebody that's not you know not used to it but what i mean is is when you walk in the room don't sit down first don't walk in ahead of somebody if you see a round table don't pick a chair until somebody else does don't just make yourself at home don't jam your hand into somebody and say so nice to meet you because you wouldn't do that if it's your mother or father that's the most respected person in your life think about them but no matter what you do, if you picture the person interviewing you as the most respected person in your world, you will never do anything wrong socially. 
And that's the reason I tell them. Because a lot of people in the younger generations, it's not that they're disrespectful, they're just not at the level that usually the person interviewing them, who's probably going to be a, older than them, usually mm -hmm. is somewhat expecting. And by being respectful, you have a chance to get the person to like you. That's number one. Number two, I'm gonna get all three of these. Number two, listen. Listen, remember the advice you got before in your first date? One of your parents said to you, remember, you know, Ellie, you need to listen. Girl's gonna wanna talk to you and they're gonna expect that you're actually listening to what they're saying. You need to listen. You got me, Ellie, you got me, you got me. <laughs> you have to listen, mm -hmm. right? And it's, uh, women listen better than men, they just do. I'm sure there are tests out there and if I was a different speaker, I'd give you all the stats. But you have to listen, why? Because at any given moment, somebody says, what was that thing that you were telling me before, really? And there's a question mark at the end of something, and you suddenly like, Whoa, wait a second, that was a question. And you have no idea what's going on because you're somewhere 5,000 miles away and you don't mean to be. Mm. You have to be active listening the entire interview. You gotta be on. If you're a coffee person, have coffee. If you're a breakfast person, make sure you eat breakfast. Make sure you are there. Which leads to number three, you have to be in the zone. You have to be in your zone the entire interview. If you're a basketball player, whatever you feel like in the middle of that game when you have all your endorphins going, you're like, oh, I'm ready to go, I can't miss a shot, I'm good, that's your zone. Get in that headspace right at that moment. If you're speaking to people, if you're teaching a class, if you're dancing, if you're whatever it is gives you that endorphin feeling of happiness, of really being present, you need to be that person the entire interview. The entire interview. So if it's a one o'clock interview and you know you start losing it in the afternoon, you make sure you have an extra cup of coffee. Have a chocolate bar, eat a tuna fish sandwich. You need to be on. Those three things, those three things will get you at least to a seven and a half out of 10 in an interview if you're doing those things. The next two and a half points is what's gonna separate you from everybody else they speak about. And that's your resume. Is it real, is it not? What's there, does it fit the job? I can't help you with that. Mm -hmm. Either it does or it doesn't. Are you answering the questions nicely? Are you answering them properly? Are you engaging? Are you doing everything else you need to do? But those little things that help you get somebody to like you in a short period of time, I'm not talking about like let's have a party and go together or go to the movies or do something. I'm talking about that somebody sees that I, I actually think I could work with this person. I could take them to lunch. I could see them fitting in in my office. That is the biggest hurdle that people don't recognize. No one hires people they don't like. Mm. They just don't. Think about your hiring. Think about the people that aren't with you anymore. If you look back now, you're like, ah, yeah, yeah, this wasn't gonna work. Mm. You mentioned quite a few books uh, throughout this uh, podcast. Is there a book related to interviews, whether someone's interviewing someone or being I interviewed? haven't written it yet. So far, it's just a pamphlet. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Good. Let there, us know when it's on There Amazon. isn't. There are a lot of people that do interview coaching. I have to be honest with you. I, I've, I've not encountered any of the stuff that I've watched or listened to that, that takes on the same thing that I'm preaching all the time. Okay. Um, and I, I, I have no problem telling people this is, this is what I think. I, I guarantee you, I've interviewed people on the phone, on, on TV, with Zoom, with, with, uh, with Teams, in person, and it's very difficult to hire somebody that you just don't like and quite frankly is not engaging, especially if you're looking them for a sales job. Now, if you're hiring somebody for finance, and let's be honest, you know, a lot of people with finance, you know, a lot of them are engaging, a lot of them are potentially slightly introverted, or maybe they're shy, but you're hiring somebody to do a specific type of job, so don't be hard on them, like, oh, you could never sell my, you're not hiring them to be in sales. Mm -hmm. So now you're thinking, do you have the skills necessary to do this? You have five years experience, I see you have your MBA, did well at school, your last job, good recommendations, people think highly of you, let's spend some time with the team for a few hours, let's do that group interview. Then you're doing something else. You have to hire the person for the job that you're hiring them for. But for sales, they also have to be able to sell themselves in an authentic and a sincere way. This is awesome. Let's talk about you. You're now a high-level VP at a Fortune 100 company, and you've spent a significant amount of time, like you mentioned, counseling others, young people in the Orthodox community, uh, preparing, interviewing, entering the workforce. When you look at the corporate world and your experience in that, it's not a traditional path for many. So for those listening and sort of weighing their options, should I enter the corporate world? Should I, you know, maybe start my own business? Should I work in the non-corporate world for someone else? How do you guide someone 
to make the right decision earlier in their career. You, you asked me, one of the first questions you asked me was about being an entrepreneur. I think it's very important for people to know early on whether they have the risk gene and the entrepreneurial gene. And the best way to figure that out, to be honest with you, is to ask somebody else what they think of them. Um, I, I mentor a lot of people at my, at my work and that are at other companies. And I found that the greatest gift somebody can get is complete unadulterated criticism, feedback, complete raw feedback, somebody that you trust enough to give you stuff. A negative comment is worth everything if you can handle hearing it and if it's delivered authentically, sincerely, and in some cases with love, mm -hmm. if you will. So my advice to somebody first, especially somebody coming out of the type of area where you're saying, is to find out if you have the strengths and the abilities to do something on your own. If you do, then my advice is to do something as early and as quickly as you can because your risk tolerance at a young age before life takes over and tuitions kick in mm -hmm. is much, much greater at that, meaning the ability to take risk than when you suddenly realize, hmm, not sure if I can do that right now. So that's, that's, that's the one biggest piece of it. And I'm not an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. corporate Americans, corporate people, as much as they say, well, you know, I have an entrepreneurial bend and I do that in my mm -hmm. company. There's a difference between knowing you're getting a paycheck at the end of the week and you're still an entrepreneur mm -hmm. as opposed to if I don't make a paycheck by the end of the week, I'm not sure if I'm paying my rent right now. Mm -hmm. That's a very different feeling for people. Um, and an entrepreneur sees that and like, that's it. I'm going to make that sale. It's going to happen. I'm going to make that product. I'm going to create this. I'm going to get financing. I'm going to buy the building. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. That's their drive, if you will. And some people don't have it. And it's the minority, I think, of people that have it. And people that are business owners on their own, they're entrepreneurs. They are. It's an amazing thing to have small business, media, large business, on your own. Tremendous risk, tremendous wisdom and ability to do that. That's the first thing. If you're not that, there's another thing people can look at. Vocations. People can be the best plumber in the world. People can be the best electrician in the world. People can be amazing teachers. People can be amazing anything. Think about something you love. Can you do something you love, be happy with it, and be able to support yourself or figure out other ways to do that? But getting to your question of corporate America, if you also want to look at what a lot of people do, which is work for large companies or medium-sized companies, how do I do that? First, first thing that most people look for is do you have a college education? Do you have a college education that's recognized that I, when I look at it, I'm like, oh, okay, I know what that school is. Or I haven't seen a school before, but I can look it up and I see that it's a school. And I see that you have grades and I see that you've taken classes and I've seen that you've graduated. And I don't look it up and it's... This is other podcasts I'm sure that you've done. Mm -hmm. It's you've gone to a college, you have a degree, you seem to be able to back that up. Fantastic. That's usually admission to a better paying job in corporate America. Corporate America is an amazing thing though because they have departments. Every single thing that you could possibly be interested in is represented in a company somewhere. I'm really good at math, finance, accounting, treasury, controller. I'm really good at speaking to people, sales, marketing, internal communications, external communications. I, uh, I have an aptitude for science or engineering. I can work for a utility. I can work for a large engineering company. I can design bridges. I can build tunnels. I can do all of these things. I can do things. I'm extremely smart. I'm not as smart in this. I'm better in this. Also, people can take aptitude tests, which exist online, and get an idea for where their strengths may be and what it is they can do. If they decide to take the corporate route, um, first of all, I'd be willing to talk to anybody that wants to think about that, but they offer amazing jobs with training, at very good starting salaries, with benefits, with, with good atmospheres, with, um, I must say, in the 25 years I've been at my company, uh, the ability to wear a yarmulke in my company, uh, the fact that I can have kosher food at an event. I've never been asked to be in an event that's on Shabbos. If something coincides with Rosh Hashanah, I get apologies, mm -hmm. and they'll either try to change it or make sure that I'm completely updated. And this happens like one less than 1%, mm -hmm. maybe, and it's an accident if you will, but it's not because of me, it's because corporate America has become more sensitive to the other, if you will. And for us, as a people, it's helpful, as long as we don't take advantage of it. People asked me when I was at CNBC for a few years, did I wear my yarmulke in the newsroom? And I always said, yeah, it was sort of my badge of honor, it set me apart. So much so that when I tweeted, I used to tweet with the uh, then CEO, might still be Jeff Weiner of LinkedIn. He bumped into one of my coworkers. He says, how's the guy with the yarmulke? Right. How's your coworker? So there was really this um, 
pride, sense of pride that I had when he mentioned that. Do you feel the same way in terms of, I'm, I'm sure there are many times you're the only one, not the only, not even the only Jew in the room, but the only person wearing a... So, full disclosure, I've only recently been able to start wearing my yarmulke full-time in the office. That's so awesome. So, by the starting of my corporate career, I obviously did everything I needed to do when I needed to do it, but from a sales perspective, um, you know, when I spoke to somebody, I spoke to Rob to get ideas of what to do, whether I interpreted it correctly or not, that's all on me, not on anybody else. It's an idea of you wouldn't want to be selling to somebody and potentially place the company at a disadvantage based on your appearance per se. If anybody's listening and I've gotten this wrong, my apologies, but that's where I was at the time. Um, and that's where I was for a while. Everybody knew I was a religious Jew. There was no question. There was no hiding it, if you say, if we had meals or if we had things or when things were occurring. And I speak about my family and people know things about me and they know that I'm not available on Shabbos and when I'm not available. And you know you're doing a good job when people say, how do I sign up for this again? Because you know, you got all these days and you mm -hmm. look like you're enjoying yourself. Is this the one with the huts? I like the huts. <laughs> I drove where I saw the huts. Why does your neighborhood not have any lights? Right. This is so interesting. Because uh, we have an office in Texas. You can see neighborhoods in Texas from, from a satellite actually. Right. So, and, and people know that. And for me, COVID has allowed me to basically, I was in my house and I'm not gonna not wear my yarmulke in my house. Right. The fact that I was on TV, that's somebody else's problem. So when I started coming back in person, it was a big deal and they saw me with my yarmulke and that was that and it's all good. And, and, and thank God, Baruch Hashem. It's, that's it's, awesome. Yeah, but, um, but my advice to people is, is to ask Shiloh's and to not just make an assumption. There, there, are, there are interesting answers for things, and I don't know how anybody would react or wouldn't react, but I encourage people to, to, to speak to their local Orthodox rabbi to make sure that they're getting the proper guidance and not just making assumptions in either direction on their own. And there are lots of great books out about it, and there are lots of people giving shurim about it, and how to be in an office, and how to, how to make a Kiddush Hashem in an office and in a business. And it's something that it's very, it is a, it is a very um, challenging atmosphere because there are a lot of people that are not like you. With all that said, though, corporate America offers a wonderful opportunity to really be able to, to thrive, to make a living, to grow, um, and to really build yourself in a business and be in an environment that today is, is really more sensitive, as I said, to people's specifics. It doesn't mean you can't produce. And if you're going in and thinking, oh, I did my eight hours, I'm done, then yeah, you're going to be done. You know, there's a job there and there's times when you have to work late and there's times you have to do things and there are ways to act when there's social things that are going on and how you can be who you need to be in a specific situation and make sure you, you do the required but not extra, if you will. And there's a lot to it. There really is and there are a lot of tremendous challenges. But if somebody's able to keep themselves and who they are, I think it's a, it's a nice opportunity. And it really, the cost of admission is something that, and I'm sure you have another podcast on it, it's it's really in most cases making sure that you have a college degree that the person recognizes and that you feel you actually got a college degree and you put some time and effort into it and here's what it is and you're able to present it properly. Um, and I've had lots of coaching sessions where people are telling me how they're going to talk about their degree and I'm like, that's just not sincere. That's not, you're not, you're not telling somebody what it is that they're going to believe. You need to present this in a different way. You mentioned if someone wants to reach out to you, what is the best way if someone does want to contact you without knocking on your front door? So, so here's the thing. Whenever I speak and do things, at the end, I usually end up giving my cell phone number. I don't think you want People write it down. People write it down. Okay. But what I know is, yeah. is that only like three people are ever going to be in contact with me. I can speak to a thousand people uh -huh. and only three people will actually contact me or do anything. I can do something at work where everybody can just look me up in the, in the, in the, work, in the address book uh -huh. and send me an email maybe four or something. People just, th they think they're excited about it, but they're never inclined to do it. Uh -huh. So the answer is, I don't know. What, what do you think the best thing is? Well, I have, let's, let's challenge them on that. You don't think you're gonna get a lot of phone calls? Guys. Call? Well, the question <laughs> is, is will I, if I get a lot, will I be able to be a sincere and authentic person actually get back to everybody and try to help them? No, I, I think you're gonna get a lot of calls. Right, so the, no. so the- I would say email is, we generally have seen that being, some people have said LinkedIn, uh, depending on, where they're comfortable, but I, see I think email I as think a LinkedIn way. actually would would be a good thing to do because I have two emails, so I have a Gmail account. Um, but if I give that and I don't see, I don't look at it every day. I look oh, at my okay. work every day because that's my main thing. Why don't people look for me on LinkedIn? LinkedIn. It's Andrew okay. Singer on LinkedIn. If you send me a message on there, if you want to connect in some way, um, or give me an idea what you're looking for, if I can help, that's fine. If I can't help you, or if 
for some reason, this is some overwhelming response, and I don't know, then I'll be honest, or I'll call you and say we need to set up an office or something. I don't know. That's awesome. We'll do a separate thing. But I just, I, I'm, I'm passionate about people giving their best shot to what they do. And a lot of kids that we deal with in our communities have never spoken to the world before. They don't know what it is to have an interview, and they don't know what they're doing. Uh, if I could, I'll, get, I'll just give you an example. Yeah, sure. So... I started, um, one of the guys in the community years ago uh, went to med school, and he was mentioning that the numbers were down. He was seeing a lot of his friends, you know, were down getting into med school, and he was convinced they just weren't doing well on the interview portion. Getting in, so I asked, so what's the interview about? What is it? So he started sending me people, and a lot of people that were really good in science and did well in their MCATs weren't necessarily ready to have a conversation with someone. And we went through the same thing I did, which is they may let somebody that's not perfect, meaning from a personality perspective, and once again, I'm not commenting on people's personalities, get into med school if you got a perfect score and they know you're going to be an amazing neuro, neurobiologist, you know, dot whatever you're going to be, you're, you know, you can do this. But if they don't like you, the next person that comes in that they do like probably going to take your spot. So let's start with the liking part. And then we get to the questions like, what have you filled out? What did you write your essay on? Well, here's what I wrote my essay on. And I start asking them questions. And in some cases, I realize, who wrote your essay? Or what do you mean by this? Or did you do this in the way that you put forth? Well, I, I'm digging into what you said was bearing your soul in this essay, mm -hmm. and you're not bearing your soul to me when we're talking about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what it is you need to do? Or you wrote these things down as the, um, the uh, externship or the internship you did. Did you do this for eight weeks or did you do this for eight minutes and you mm -hmm. put it down? Like, what did you do here? And do you think nobody's going to notice that? It, it, I hope what I'm saying is coming across. It's, it's, you can't just dance your way through an interview. And if you're the person that did dance your way through and you got in, it's probably because you're the one with the perfect score or something else worked out. I help people when I can for their interviews for, uh, for their first law job. So people get interviewed usually um, right before their 2L year. They'll get interviewed going into that, and they're already looking for people that they're going to potentially offer that job to, that big, high-paying job potentially, although they're farther and fewer between, as I understand it, for that second year going into third year and potentially get a job offer. So I was speaking with somebody years ago, and the person had not been successful, probably about nine or ten interviews. And stop me if it's too much on this. But so, so I said to him, so, so we went through the friend thing and everything. The person's looking. And I know when somebody doesn't believe anything that I'm saying. So, fine. So, so take me through your last interview. So the person said, well, this, this woman walked in and she said, so tell me about yourself. And the person, he's talking to me and he said, you know, I was like, I'm this, yada, yada, yada. I'm this, I'm yada, yada, and I yada, yada. And you know, that was that. Actually saying yada, yada. Yes, oh, yes. Man. I'm not a yada, yada guy. <laughs> so, okay, fine. So I said, so what was the next question? Next question was, well, what do you enjoy most in school? I said, like, well, law school, you know, I took this class, yada, yada, that class, yada, yada, that class. I said, okay, can I give you some feedback? And, I, and he said, yeah. I said, what does that woman that came in have that you want? I said, what do you mean? I said, like, a job. They're a partner at a, at, a, at a big law firm, and they worked their tootsies off from the time they got in until they made partner. They have a job. They have a job, and they're holding out a job for you. And in your mind, you're doing yada yada, and you think that this person that's, I'll put them in their 40s, that has encountered thousands of people in their life and has made it to partner a law firm, can't read you like a book at a poker table? Like, do you think they don't know that in your mind, you're just like, whatever, look at my grades and give me a job? What do you, what, what, what do you mean? And I looked at the person, I said, you're repulsive. He's like, what? He said, I apologize. I love you. You're a nice person. But what you're doing to them is you are repelling everything that they're trying to do for you. It's literally bouncing off of you and falling on the floor. You're repulsing them. And I use that word sometimes in these interview training things because I find it's only kind of like we talked in the beginning about the break in the glass type thing, breaking through. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, Mr. Singer just said, he looks serious. Well, hold on a second. My dad didn't say he was this serious. Like, what's going on? Do you understand... So I took him back and I said, here's the deal. We're going to do this again. And you're going to give me answers and we go through it. He got a job on the next interview. Without the yada yada. I assume so. <laughs> or at least that's what he told me. So Baruch Hashem, he got a job. This has been awesome. Really, really appreciate you coming down. Um, I do expect you to 
get a f- quite a few messages on the LinkedIn side of things. Um, looking forward to having you again. Yaakov, did you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Okay. okay. This is it. I don't know what he's asking. This is unplanned. Wait, does Yaakov work with you? He, we work to, he actually worked here in the company, and then um, he has an office here in my office, but not necessarily. So if he's not going to be asking, like, how do I take over a business that may be near to mine or something? Well, like I'm that. here, so if he is this transparent. <laughs> so I have a brother who has a business that needs a lot of – no. Um, first off, could I get you a Mountain Dew? Uh, it's interesting you asked me, but I don't need that much caffeine right now. Okay. So the answer is no. I would like <laughs> by to, the way, I don't even I'd li- like to fall in the hole right now. <laughs> I don't even like Mountain Dew. I just need to say that. I just thought it was uh, it the most keeps, it, keep, it keeps everybody up all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so you, you spoke about a lot of interesting things in this episode. I have a lot of questions, but I just want to ask one question is, you're talking about sales and you're talking about rejection. And I, at least from my experience with Kosher Money or just these other podcasts, that when we call for people to potentially do ads with us or to sponsor, we get rejected a lot. Mm-hmm. We get rejected a lot more than people say, yes, let's do it. Uh, what's your advice for for anyone listening when they get rejected, whether it's for a job or in sales? Uh, what's the best way to go about that and accept that? And, can I just and I'm going to go off the camera. That, so. you can take it. Um, anyone listening that would like to sponsor an episode, um, we would love to have that. And, and it's been a challenge for us because we got the first few episodes sponsored and we got enough funds to get it edited and broadcasted or whatnot. But get there's so much more we can do. Like this particular interview, I would love to have it transcribed, put into different publications, broadcasted in various different mediums. You can't do that without funds and people. So that's sort of the challenge we're running into mm-hmm. when we try to pitch them our beautiful pitch deck with the benefits, et cetera. We're just getting uh, doors shut in our face. Okay, so there, there are two main things that I'm hearing in your question. So the, the first one is that there's a rejection issue. Mm-hmm. And the second one is, is potentially how to sell something. Okay, so let me just deal with the rejection issue just for a second, and then maybe I'll, we, can, we can riff a bit on selling something. Rejection is a part of sales, period. Um, even people that have an existing customer book when they come in, so they don't get rejected enough. If they don't get rejected at all, they're usually in a farming position as opposed to what we call a hunting position in, in sales. There's no, there's no crime to being in a farming position. They just don't pay as well as a hunting position, usually, if that's what's going on. Rejection is part of sales, So with that said, what you need to understand is what's going to be your hit rate. So sales is a science. You have to fill a funnel and you have to fill a pipeline. And I know those are all words that you'll see in a sales book, but it is the truth. Because when you fill a pipeline with 100 leads or 100 prospects, you're hoping that at the bottom, 25, 10, 1, depending what it is you think your hit rate should be in your business, and you can compare yourself here to media sales or other things that you think, what's the hit rate? Is it 10%? Is it 25%? A lot of industries that I'm with, new sales, the rate you're looking for is 25 to 30%, right? Sometimes it's gone down a bit. With that said, though, if you're just literally trying to get that sale, you're going to get rejected and you're going to go home upset. If you've made 100 calls that day, out of 100 calls, when I... Let me, let me do this. When I started in sales, mm-hmm. a good friend of mine that was selling insurance told me the following. You need to make a rule for, your, for yourself. What's a successful day? What allows you to basically close your computer at the end of the day? And what he told me was you either, either um, made two appointments or closed a deal. That's your goal every day. So if your first two calls of the day are two appointments, shut the computer, you're done. If your first call of the day is you close the deal, shut the computer, you're done. But if it takes you 100 calls that day and you still haven't made an appointment, then you need 101 and 102 Mm -hmm. because that's a successful day. And if you speak to people that are career salespeople and have career salespeople and have been successful, ask them. You would be so surprised that this person that you think is just a schmoozaholic in a nice suit or a nice outfit with this and that and the tan and this and that, they are OCD about their process. They know exactly what they're doing. They know when they're doing it and everything else. Now, if they seem to be out there or maybe a little scattered, it's an act in a lot of cases. They are who they need to be. David Sandler in his training said an amazing thing. He said the best sales people of the world are psychiatrists directing a Broadway play. Psychiatrists directing a Broadway play. Psychiatrists because they understand people. They know when to speak and when to listen. Right? Psychiatrist, somebody's on the sofa, you're just listening most of the time. Mm. Sometimes in Freudian analysis, you're just listening forever. Don't really know that, but anyway. Directing, nothing happens that you're not directing to happen. If I go on a pitch 
with Yaakov, and he is the expert, and I am the salesperson, Yaakov's sitting right next to me so I can kick him as hard as possible before he says something stupid, right? He's the technical person, I'm the salesperson. Nothing goes on the table that I don't know is going on the table. Mm. I'm directing it, Broadway play. Everything that's happening, I have set up ahead of time. I know where that is, I know where this is, I know everything that's going to happen. Nothing is by chance. When you're a lawyer, they tell you, never ask why and never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. That's because you don't want to screw up what it is you've put together. So with that said, you're going to get rejected, and you need somebody that's able to do that. That's that piece. Any questions on that? No. Okay. Next piece, your business. I don't know a thing about your business, but just in the way you were talking about it, if you were to approach my company, an energy company, and try to pitch them on sponsoring something, and you're not talking about a charitable sponsorship, you're not saying anything else, the first question I would ask, I think, is... What demographic are you going after in your business? And they'll say, um, we're looking at business owners of companies above $30 million in revenue or probably Fortune 1000 mid-level executives. Okay. Interesting you should say that. Do you mind if I share some information about our podcast on one of the demographics you mentioned? No, that's okay. So you mentioned this business owners. We actually did a measurement of our last 10 podcasts, of which we had 150,000 users. Of those 150,000, the unique percentage was this, meaning they were new to each one. Mm -hmm. Repeats were this. This is what the industry average is. We're actually above industry average by 12.3%. Just an aside. Just an aside. The group that you're looking for, they're over here. That's that number. Is this a grouping that you'd be looking at, this business owner in the $30 million range? Well, how do you know that? Do you employ surveys in your business? Yeah, we actually do. What kind of survey results are you having? Well, we're surveying this, we're looking at LinkedIn. Interesting. We did surveys on the last five podcasts that we did. This is the information that we got back. And we actually have three other advertisers that have gotten returns on this. What kind of returns have you had in the past on advertising that you've done? Well, we did this, we stopped doing this. Have you ever done a podcast before? No, we haven't. I don't know anything about it. What do you think a podcast does? Well, isn't that the stuff on the phone that my kid listens to all the time? Interesting. Would it surprise you to know that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm playing with you mm -hmm, here, but mm -hmm. I would think that if you want to pitch somebody on sponsoring, you need to explain to them why it's a value to them. Mm -hmm. It's not just 15,000 people. It's who are the people? Like maybe you need to run a survey at the end of your podcast. Maybe you need three button pops or just one. Right. But that's how I would initially start looking at it. I know if that's helpful. That is. Yaakov, yeah. is that helpful? That's great. That's awesome. But I don't know if that's something you can or can't do. But there are people out there that can help you with that. Like I have a friend that does surveys or thinks about a way to get somebody just to answer a question. I mean, J.D. Power, I mean, they tell you this car is the best in the world. It's one question. Mm -hmm. The second probably, you drive off the lot. We probably need someone to focus on the sales for us for this so we can focus on creating the content. That's probably the real answer. Right, but you're entrepreneurs, so the reason you're successful right now is because you've been doing everything. Right. You want to met under? Yeah. Andrew, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Best of luck. Thank you. There you have it. Ellie Langer, Andrew Singer. Ellie, what is what was your favorite part or lesson or tip from Andrew? I loved, and he did this quite a few times in the episode. Is that helpful? Did you take something away from that? Where I initially thought he was just trying to make sure I wasn't spacing out, right. but I learned that he inherently wanted to make sure he was helping me or helping our audience, and he was sincere about it. So I, I kind of find in when when I'm in prospective sales meetings and I'm having conversations with with a prospective client, checking in to say, are the questions that I'm asking, is the insight that I'm giving to you, is it helpful? Um, I think that can be a real game changer. You, of course, yeah, well, yeah no, I'm making a joke. You continue, yeah. Uh, okay, you're going to ask me if I find... No, I'm going to say, like, maybe you should do that during the episode, like, every five minutes. You should ask the audience, is that helpful? That's Yaakov's new um, <laughs> podcast coming out. It's oh, called Is, that is This Helpful? <laughs> but Yaakov has quite a few podcasts. We, has, we, we together, yeah. No, this is Living L'Chaim. He has um, not your typical podcast with Charlene Aminoff. That's been taking off. Um, he has Spirit of the Song, if you're into Jewish music. And now he has a new podcast on mental health called That's an Issue. Yeah, with the Kleschaks, Dr. and Mr. Kleschak. Mental health is very important to me, um, to a lot of people. I think it's going to help 
bring help to a lot of people, but more importantly, it's going to break the stigma around it. Would you say? I, I think so, and and we've shot a bunch of episodes and they're very insightful. And I think it's going to be kind of the sister podcast to Kosher Money. You know, Kosher Money is he, like <laughs> he, he's, not, you, he's trying to ride. Is going to be the child? No, podcast? but you should know YouTube. We're coming up to I think twenty thousand subscribers by the time this airs. It might cross twenty. It, it, we will be over 20. I'm curious if it will be near 30. What happened? So we, we released the A Brewer episode. Yeah, the A Brewer episode really, I, th- I mean, we don't, I don't really know. I don't know the answer. I think a lot of Hasidim um, like saw the episode and it's like, hey, this is very interesting. And they start watching it. And then that just helped our algorithm. And then there's a lot of Hasidim out there. There's a lot of Hasidim. I don't know, it's like, and they love Andre, a brewer. Of them. They love. They love. It's energy. a great story. Obviously, the the title is very you know um, catchy, juicy, catchy, and um, I think it just started showing to people that aren't Jewish, right? Um, which we're thrilled with. We want to you know show the world um, our lessons and tips and talk to whether it's different rabbis or different uh, uh, leaders about what they do. So then we noticed the episode with Naftali Horowitz that also jumped to over 100,000 views and people from Thailand and Israel and France and other languages. And it was across the U.S., um, England. People were, I could just name random countries. No one's going to ever know. (laughs) You know, Timbuktu. I I don't know if that's a country. Go to the the comments and you'll be able to see all of yeah all of the places people are from naftali actually texted me before he said i have a new full-time job he's yeah. just answering all the questions so if you're a viewer and you're curious about naftali or the lessons you could uh send them an email i think it's on the show notes so naftali's english name is actually mark right and right. mark horowitz if you go into um i think he was episode two if you look in the comment section it has over 500 comments um <laughs> And right. you can see Mark Horowitz replying to them. Um, so if you want free, unsolicited advice um, from right. Mark, just head to the YouTube comment section and you'll have a very uber successful um, JP Morgan, whatever the department he's in, um, give it to you. And we want to give a shout out to our good friend who's, who's what, the third leg to this podcast, Zavi yes, Woolman, and his organization, Living Smarter Jewish. If you have any questions, practical questions like, okay, how do I budget or I need some mentoring in my business or whatever it is money related, you can send an email to info at livingsmarterjewish.org and Zevi and the team will take care of you. Yeah, he said right now he's getting dozens a day. I think, on. I feel like you say that like every, like that's your No, no, now. it's not. It's it, he, You say dozens all the time. You yeah, say you dozens of listeners. But it could be 12,000, could be dozens. It, it's, it's, it it's crazy to see the amount of people, Jewish or not, that have an interest in taking control of their personal finance. Um, and we hope to continue helping you for many more years to come. If you have a guest suggestion, you know the WhatsApp number by heart? I don't, do you? I think I can you better pull it up. Um, but I will look it up in a second. We love feedback. A lot of our guests came as a result of your voice notes, of your suggestions. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say, like, we, we both look at it. I think I, I pay a little more attention to the Living L'Chaim uh, WhatsApp number. So please, we love suggestions. We love ideas. We love thoughts and feedback. But you can read it. But please don't voice note. If I mean, you, yes, voice note him. He loves no, I, voice I, notes. It's funny because Ellie, I voice note Why all the voice time. Notes? Voice notes I good. voice note Ellie all the time. And I don't totally want your voice notes. I want people, no. I want listeners' voice oh, notes. Oh, you really want it? Yeah, I don't want your voice notes. I want listeners' voice notes. It doesn't go notes. like that. It's either my voice notes and theirs. I kind of feel they're more giving with their thoughts when it's How when about they're this? talking. If you need to do a voice note, do a voice note. But we, pref- I prefer text. Go to Yako's house and give him no, feedback no, 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 no. Uh, outside his window. <laughs> um, okay, 914-222-5513. 914-222-5513. WhatsApp, text, call, write a letter. Don't call. We want your feedback. YouTube, subscribe. If you have an iPhone, take your iPhone out, please. Five stars in the podcast section. Write a review. It really helps And us. if you're listening on Spotify, you can now... Uh, rate five stars on Spotify and it helps. You know, every time you rate a five stars, Ellie and I and Zevi, we get a pat on our back. And if you're listening on Shopify, I don't know how you're doing that. That's an e-commerce store website. Never know. That so is true. That right by the time uh, yeah. this episode airs, they might have a podcast network of their own. I'm Ellie Langer. I'm Yaka Langer. Have a great day. That's Finish. Mayor Case. <laughs> <laughs> you finished with your catchphrase. Oh.
or kosher money. Keep your money kosher, kosher money. Peace. The Kosher Money Podcast is hosted by Ellie Langer, run by Zevi Woolman, Ellie Langer, and myself, Yaakov Langer, and it is produced by Living L'Chaim. For more awesome podcasts and shows, check out livinglechaim.com, check us up on YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Living L'Chaim.